Hello and welcome to, well, hello and welcome to the 4,000 plus subscribers video, the thank you video. Now, here's the thing, what topic should I do? What topic is suitable for a thank you video? Well, I decided the modern Navy, if I, uh, Royal Navy, if I was Prime Minister, what I would be building because people often talk about the phrase fantasy fleets and this and that and the other. And I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, but I do like the idea of putting together a coherent idea for what kind of force structure you would have. Because I always remember the point. The current force structure we have reflects the current amount of money the government is prepared to spend on it. Okay. So, I haven't actually added in the costs and things of what I'm going to be doing. Or what I would add on. But I'm not adding, making things mahusif. I'm not going extreme. In fact, I have criteria, and if you want to, follow me along and produce your own fleets, then please do follow the same criteria. First off, though, a quick mention of bilge pumps. Link down below. Bilge pumps is very cool. It's the um, podcast with me, Drac, and Jamie from Armour Carriers. And it's done so well, the free taster episodes. We've got our own channel now. Well, hey. And basically, if you turn it on, you'll keep it on. The more people that it's uh, listening to it, the more it's shared, the more it's the more the bilge pumps memes in the in my discord grows, the more we'll keep doing. Basically, that's our policy. As long as people are enjoying it, we're going to keep on doing it because we enjoy it. But, you know. And that is one of my favourite memes which comes from. America needs beautiful white ships. <laughs> yeah. I do like the US Coast Guard. They're a cool group. Right, so the criteria you... Just in case I said you feel like doing wrong. Everything proposed has to be justifiable and within reason. Based on existing or projected equipment. I.e. no fantasy... Oh, we're going to have... Phaser rifles and a starship and this sort of thing. I, I love that idea, but if you're you want to avoid the sort of the you know instead of going for a fantasy fleet, this is going for what a fleet I would have if I was in charge and had the power. And why have I limited myself to the Royal Navy? Well, for three reasons. For one, I love the Royal Navy, and I'm a naval historian. This is the area I know best. I'm not wandering into the Army's area, and I'm not wandering into the Air Force's area. Barring a couple of points. Two. You do not succeed in life by tearing others down. In the nicest way, the lesson of the CVA-01 F-001 uh, scenario and all the politics that went on that was both the Navy lost its carriers and the Royal Air Force didn't get its strike aircraft. And very soon the Royal Air Force lost their V-bomber force and their long-range bomber capability. So all, their, all the, the, the fighting had accomplished was it provided the argument for those people who would prefer to spend the money on very worthy topics like education and health and policing and all those things had the arguments they needed to take them down. And it was furnished for them by the services. In the nicest way, the equivalent would be in the Department of Education, universities and school, uh, universities, secondary schools and primary schools competing for the funding by saying the others aren't needed. Oh, you don't need PE in primary school or you don't need this or that. That would be the equivalent. Because you need all three, combined with the third for education and all edu education colleges and all the education system to develop a, to deliver a proper balanced education system which can actually respond to the majority of needs of the majority of the public. Okay, you're never going to get it perfectly one hundred percent. Not when you're doing a government system for an entire nation based off tax money. To start because remember the government spending. Uh, the money they're getting taxes, so they're spending your money. So, 
In the nicest way, the armed forces is the only time I regularly see this going on. And I don't like it, and I don't agree. And I know sometimes in my younger days, I might well have engaged in parts of it. Um, but I'm older, and I've learnt. And frankly, I don't see the point in it. So I may or may not like a system in use by another service. I may or may not occasionally make a joke about it. But I'm not going to start writing sermons or videos attacking them, saying it shouldn't be funded, saying my system should be funded. So, no. I will make the case for funding systems. But I'll never make it by slagging off others. And if that is your entire case of funding, if your entire case of funding is you should be funding mine because this system is terrible for this reason and this system is terrible for this reason, which belong to other services, then look yourself in the mirror and go, are you actually competing for the, uh, the defence of the United Kingdom, for the defence of your nation, or are you just competing for the preservation of your service? Because if that's what you're doing, are you really owing yourself to your oath and to your national interests, or are you just looking after your own back pocket? Anyway, that's enough sermonising. So, I'm not going to get into that because, as I said, I think it's stupid. And the amount of times I see different people launching attacks on aircraft carriers or tanks or artillery or strike aircraft or Eurofighters or this. No, don't. If you're an Air Force, uh, if an Air Force historian turns to me and goes, this is what the Air Force need. They do need this, this, this. That's fine. I respect that assessment because they know what they know about the Air Force and they know it better than I do. In return, I hope they respect mine when I'm naval historian and I go, well, in my opinion, this is what we need. Da, 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 da. Based on this, they'll do that. They'll not just say that that's me trying to get funding from them or them getting funding from me. It's not that case. You make the case for funding your own equipment and ignore the other services. Let them make the case for their own funding. Don't turn it into a fight because that's always used by the people who want to get the money for their own things. And they aren't bad people. Again, this is the other thing. The amount of times I see people talking about defence spending and they're going, oh, people who want to spend it on others, they're terrible. They don't understand the security nation. No, that's not the case. The case is they're worried about education. They're worried about health. They're worried about policing. They're worried about all these other things, which are things you also have to worry about. Because there isn't a magic money tree. There isn't infinite supply of money. It's got to be go around, and it's got the case has got to be made for it. But if you make that case for your funding by tearing down others, don't be surprised if they make the case for their funding by tearing down yours, and in which case you're both going to get torn down in favour of the people who just build their cases up. Anyway. Out of the serious bit, into the fun bit, the funky bit. So, the force proposed. I've been on about this ages, and I've, you know, my two Queen Elizabeths and my three Canberras, sort of slightly modified cameras, make sure they can still accommodate and operate F-35Bs. But basically, the idea is you have uh, a genesis of five ships you can build your reach around. And I'll get into this more. And I've got RFA are my next most important category, because there is no point having... It's like in American football. You put a lot of money into your quarterback. Okay? They're critical. They're the ones who are going to get everything down the field. But your next amount of money goes into the person whose job it is to make sure your quarterback has the time to do that. So there are several offensive linemen who want to crush you, to want to crush that quarterback. That's their entire job. Your next most important money, amount of money goes on the person whose job it is to prevent them doing that. It's a team effort. Well, in the same as the it's the same in the navy. You have the forces you want to get round the world because they're how you influence events ashore and at sea. But to get those forces around the world, you need the, the, the force you need to get those things around the world are your next most important things. Okay? 
So that is where you need these ships. And then you've got escorts, got some raw marine stuff. I've got, which is where I get into the army stuff. I've got aircraft. I have mentioned some land base, which is where I get into the RF stuff. But I, please note, I'm again, I'm making a case for funding of things. And I've got some enablers stuck in that. And I'll explain these things. So, global reach. Air group, size, amphibious lift. Air group, size, amphibious lift. Now, why have I left those blank? Well, it's actually not because I didn't fill them in. I did fill them in, and then I decided not to. Because A, you can modify the Canberra class a bit, and B, you can modify the Queen Elizabeth class a bit. Basically, the Queen Elizabeth class can take about half a battalion of troops. We're probably talking about 400 Royal Marines normally, but honestly, if you were really pushing it, you could probably fit 800 aboard her. Um, it would stretch the facilities a bit, and they wouldn't be getting necessarily the best form of accommodation to sleep in, but you could probably do it. There's, they're big ships, and they've got space. Air group, roughly 44 aircraft. Um, so honestly, operationally, you're probably talking well 44 to 50 something across I think actually yeah you're probably talking about two squadrons F-35Bs and a really enhanced squadron of Merlin EH-101s and when I say enhanced squadron of Merlins I mean you probably got a hopefully you're going to have a squadron of ASW airframes on there you're going to have another flight for commando lift as standard and another flight for airborne early warning so uh, you could end up with quite a few helicopters aboard. Because that's how the Royal Navy works things. And again, with the Canberra class, um, you have air group. They can take quite a few. Not as many as the Queen Elizabeth class, but they can take enough. What I like is I like the picture which shows out exactly what an LHD is. You've got the dock. You've got the flexi deck where you've got all sorts of military stores on. You've got the accommodation. You've got the hangar. You've got the flight deck. Okay, this is what these ships are, and I'm saying you need three of them. Now, why do you need three of those and two of the strike, uh, two of the Queen Elizabeth class? Well, a opening up the Queen Elizabeth class and building a third, I'd love to, but it would cost way too much. It'd be prohibitive, especially for what would be a one-off. Secondly. Whilst Britain has a need for the strike capability, we honestly need the amphibious capability just as much for our global presence, for the ability to influence events, because it's basically a case of we uh, we want to be in a position, and in this case I'm making a case that we need to be in a position where we can turn up with a full-spectrum task force. The full-spectrum task force is carrier strike and amphibious, stri and amphibious landing group. Okay? And a Canberra-class size vessel, along with a base-class size vessel, is a significant military force. We're talking in the region of two and a half to 3,000 troops. Okay? Depending off if you maybe have some more sitting on some of the, uh, some of the other auxiliaries and if some people aren't exactly having the best accommodation time. Would be in a Canberra-class and a Bay-class. Roughly. In a Bay class successor, which could take maybe 800 troops, you would definitely be talking about that sort of number. And so that's about half, a third to half a brigade in terms of modern numbers. It would certainly be built round a commando and would could be self-contained with its own artillery, its own manoeuvre elements, all these sort of things it needs. So it'd be a self-contained force. You'd have a carrier and you'd have the escorts. So you'd have all you needed. And you'd have both ships would be able to operate the same aircraft. So both ships could operate F-35B, both ships could operate EH-101 Merlins in their various configurations. So whilst, honestly, the amphibious side of the Queen Elizabeth class is far less than the amphibious side of the Canberra class, and the aviation side of the Canberra class is far less than the Queen Elizabeth class. If you have the scenario where you have one Queen Elizabeth class in major refit and the other one gets damaged, 
then if in a push comes to shove, one of your Canberra class can fill in for your Queen Elizabeth class as your strike carrier in a limited way. In the same scenario, if for some reason all three of your Canberra class aren't available, your strike carrier, Queen Elizabeth, can in a limited way fill in for the Canberra class. She can't fill in dockwise, but that might mean you'd have to take extra bay class with you, which is why you have three to four of them. Okay. But basically, an amphibious LHD, like a camera class, is a one-stop ship, a one-stop shop for warfare in limited scenario. For dealing with most non-peer threats, LHD will be fine. With a strike carrier along as well, that means you can deal with peer threats. So basically, your strike carrier is your ability to deal with anyone causing you trouble in the world who's actually managed to fund their military. Because the modern world is missiles and weapon systems are proliferating even more. Even more groups are having them. So having that facility, having that capability is critical to global reach and global presence. And you need it. If you're a global nation, and if you depend on the world system staying broadly stable, even if it does transition, it transitions in a stable, calm way. You need to be able to show up to whatever's going on with significant enough presence to influence events. Okay? Showing with force, especially with naval force, doesn't mean you're starting a war. It can be putting a lid on things, going, look, we've shown up. This is what we can bring to the party. Okay? It's big. It's got a lot of F-35s on it. It's got a lot of helicopters on it. And it's got a little sister over there, which has a lot of Royal Marines on them. Either one. Not something you want to have a party with. Well, you do want to have a party with, but not the kind of party we're talking about. You want the kind of dinner party we'll throw, because that's a lovely diplomatic occasion. So, you know, that's what we're going for. Global Reach Foundation. Now, I've got the literal strike ship there, and I really like it as a concept. I consider having that forward-based in regions, along with Type 31s, to be and river class batch freeze to be an absolute masterstroke. Because that means you can afford to have your carriers and your amphibious task groups being a reaction force. And you can send them when things are getting an issue in a place. You can send them as a blanket, whereas this one is constantly there. So if you need something small to just deal with it quietly, pinprick wise, that's going to be perfect. But for that to work, you do need to start organizing the Royal Marines in a way which is going to make it work. You're going to need a special commando or a special, perhaps even a regiment, it would have to be called. Because if you have four of them, like I've put forward, you need, especially if you're going to start forward basing them in multiple areas. And I think you do need them in multiple areas. And I think you need them there pretty much permanently. You need one in the Indian Ocean. You need one in the South Atlantic covers um, Africa, South America, and all these areas. You need two more, because there are other areas in the world. You might want to have one sitting in the Pacific. If you need to maybe rapidly secure and support an ally in their claim to an island, um, you know, these are the sort of ships you need. Bay class successors, tankers. Basically, we have currently got two wave class and four tie class. We've got six, six tankers. My view is that we should have about eight ties. That makes sense to me. And I like the wave class. And if, frankly, if we could, I would have four of them and eight tides. But I'm trying to be sensible. And economically, if you can go for eight tied level vessels, that's a 80% solution, a 85% solution to all your problems. You can work around the remaining 15%. I want four solid store ships because in the nicest way, if you're operating on that, if you end up operating in the Pacific, in the Far East, and let's be honest, the way China keeps playing around, you have to think about it. I think you're going to need more store ships than we're currently estimating. We currently have three. People are talking as going as low as two. I don't think that's enough. I can see it working on paper, 
and I can see it working in a lot of scenarios, but I'm not sure if it gonna, it's going to work if you're in a scenario where you might lose ships. And you have to be honest, that is a scenario we could be in. Okay? I don't want a massively huge Royal Navy. I'm not arguing for a massively huge Royal Navy, but I am in my numbers in factoring in a bit in terms of resilience to deal with potential losses. It's like I'd like eight point class, but again, four. Daring class, six. Type 26, city class, nine. Type 45 successor, nine. Okay, so let me explain where these figures are coming from. I want one more Type 26. My reasoning is this. I want to be able to generate three task groups, each of two Darings, Air Daring Defense Destroyers, and three Type 26s. Now you're going to say, oh, what about four presents and all these things? Leave that second, because that's going to explain more in Type 31s. But these are terms of the ships which are your major presence when they turn up. They're raising the stakes. But also they're your war fighting capital. And with my structure, I have gone for two strike carriers and three LHDs. So therefore, you're very much going to have probably have a carrier battle group and an amphibious task group. And in the nicest way. You might well be in a scenario where you have more and need more escorts than that, in which case allies could well come on. And again, that's a good having that system because that will slot in with Canadian, with Australian, with American forces or other allies who we can slot in with. These assets would slot in quite well with them. In this case, so this is basically is how you form free escort groups. Okay. So that's why I've gone for nine city class type 26. Again, I, I, we're building eight. So asking for one more is not, I think, asking for an excessive amount or excessively un or unjustifiable. It's going to require more crew. Yes, all these numbers will require more crew and will require personnel to be built up. My own estimate is roughly uh, you'd have to increase to, to increase all these things. You'd have to increase the Royal Navy by about 25% in personnel. Um, which is a lot of people and a lot of recruiting. But again, this is, to an extent, this is, as I said, this is the Navy I would like to make the case for and I'm arguing for. And the reason I'm making it is because this provides you with options. You have the free escort groups. That means you can mount your carrier battle group and your amphibious task group. And the reason I'm talking about nine successes for the Type 45 is because then that guarantees you can mount those those groups, but also it gives you the options, if necessary, with the Type 31s of forming up other groups or using those Type 45s as semi-permanent presence somewhere in the world if you need them, those successes. Now, if you get the Type 45 successes coming into service, you're not going to have the Daring class in service anymore. They might be placed in reserve, but hey, I doubt it though. They're probably going to be hardly uh, very well used during their lives, in which case they probably won't get placed in reserve. But that would still give you a core escort force of 18 to build around your core capital ships in that way, your carriers and your amphibious ships, your cameras, your, LH, your strike carriers and your LHDs. Right, Peace Fighting Global Presence Task Force. So, these are not part of the regular task force structure, but I certainly see in any battle scenario, Type 31s would be drawn into the battle groups as the close escorts for the carriers, the amphibs, these sort of scenarios. Now, I've put 10 to 12 for Type 31s, and I forward based two in the Falklands to cover South America, South Atlantic, Antarctic, and Africa, and, well, the west coast of Africa. Basically, to build regions, uh, to go around doing the presence mission, which the Royal Navy traditionally had ships in that region for, to make sure we have a presence down there, which is in what is a significant area ecologically and important to the world, and so important to the global environment as well as important to Britain, and therefore you need a sort of presence if you're going to influence what's going on down there, and backing up the Antarctic patrol ship, 
And if 12, I've got two based in Gibraltar for the Mediterranean, because the Mediterranean is, again, a critical area of trade. These are critical areas where trade is flowing around the world, and Britain is dependent on the global trade network. Also, and this is something I'm sort of trying to stress, the theory always was that with the European being members of the European Union and members of NATO, it didn't matter if Britain didn't have its own ships there, other navies would have their ships there. Well, as we've seen, the reality was that you still needed to be present yourself if you were going to have much of a say in what was going on. You have a very distant say if you are not there yourself. And now we're no longer in the European Union. We're still in NATO, but you need to be part of NATO. You need to be part of our other alliances around the world. You need more presence. So I've basically doubled up the presence. I've got two in Bahrain because I see two ships being forward based in Bahrain very good for our presence, not just in the Gulf, but also in the Indian Ocean. I've got two in Singapore. Again, that's for the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, Southeast, uh, and Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Two in the Falklands, as I said, South America, Africa, Antarctica, but also, again, parts of the Pacific. And, you know, this gives us presence around the world. The remainder based in the UK, they would include any vessels which are doing deep refit, so they could do deep refit back in the UK. But also those would be the ships which could be pottering around the UK, providing the training for the crews going to forward basing, providing the on-call escort in the UK, if case of major powers showing up with an aircraft carrier or something off our shore needing escort. Those sort of scenarios, they're there for. Um, and also then I've got a river class B3 sloop. I've taken your batch two river class and I've played around with it a little bit. And I've added a double 40 millimeter bofors forward to replace the current 30 millimeter. Um, two single 30 millimeters with Martlet missiles uh, attachments above the funnel, um, probably mounted on sponsons in such a way that they can fire forward and aft covering it, giving it fairly good cover. Um, I'd like three Stanflex modules from the Danish. Again, it's existing technology. It's not, uh, we're buying a Danish design for the Type 31. I see no, no problem with buying Stanflex as well. If we could buy Stanflex for the Type 31, I'd be very, very happy, but I doubt we will get, we won't get that. But Stanflex for the B3, uh, for the b freeze rivers would be quite good. And, um, one forward between the bridge and the Bofors, which you can arm as you need to for whatever scenario that ship's going to be in. And to either side of the UAV hangar, which you'd of course have a UAV hangar on the back. And a stern ramp with the ability to deploy towed array, sonar or boat, small USD. Currently there is a space underneath the hangar, which is a after space for extra accommodation, extra bunk space. Um, I'm basically replacing that to an extent with a stern ramp so you can deploy boats and these sort of things. You might then need to stretch the ship a little bit, a little bit from the B2, but honestly, the basic B, uh, the basic B2 design will fit most of that in quite happily without too much trouble. And I've got them basis force multipliers. So basically the type 31s I've considered, they're going to be, these are going to be the forward presence of Britain's visibility in the area. You're going to have the B3s for going into smaller ports, saying hello, exercising the local forces, being presence, and the Type 31s being the bigger presence. So if you've got an issue like um, uh, Straits of Hormuz and the Iranians again, well, the Royal Navy would have quite a strong force in there. A, its MCMVs would be able to have escort because one of the rivers could easily be sent off to escort the M MCMVs, or maybe a Type 31 could be. And the other Type 31 and the MCM uh, rivers, or the other river and the Type 31s, could go and secure the um, movement of... The, the merchant ships, and if one of those Type 31s happens to be being in the Indian Ocean doing duty down there, because we've had an issue with piracy off Somalia, something like that, and that's been the alert ship which is gone, then there's still enough force that you can multiply the presence of the Type 31, which is still there. So it's basically using that as forward-based areas and going, this is your area, boom. And very much to do that, you would have to have a senior officer put in charge of them. You would have to have 
either a senior captain, probably a senior captain, and it's going to sound strange. I'm going to say, use a Frank, uh, uh, use a strange rank here. I'm going to say you want a Commodore pennant rather than a Commodore flag. Okay? Commodore flag is a commissioned Commodore. So they actually have the rank of one star in the Royal Navy. Commodore Pedant is a captain who is given the rank of Commodore for operational needs. So they're considered a one star in terms of operational requirements. And I would have senior captains, Commodore Pedants, in charge of various stations, to use the language I'm most comfortable with, which is, of course, interwar history. So I would have the Gulf and Indian Ocean and the Gulf and the Western Indian Ocean and sort of Eastern Africa all belonging to one station, which would be, I don't know, let's call it um, the Bahrain station. Then I would have Eastern uh, Indian Ocean and Western Pacific belonging to the Singapore station. Then I would have Well, in nicest way, the Eastern Pacific and the Southern Atlantic and Antarctica belonging to the... Someone's decided on my road to racetrack. The uh, Eastern Pacific and Southern Atlantic and... South Atlantic and... To an extent... Well, actually, no. We'll go for the South Eastern Pacific and the South Atlantic and Antarctica belonging to the Falklands Station. And, of course, the west coast of Africa, whole of South America they get them, and the North America, uh, that's um, North America, that is, would be the North East Pacific, and the uh, North Atlantic belonging to home. Maybe Mediterranean gets a sort of bit, you know, because they get the Mediterranean, so which, where would they get? If you've got Gibraltar, they get Mediterranean. They might get get something like Central Atlantic, so they can take that area. North Africa, Central Atlantic, Mediterranean, and something. And I would have these staffs, these positions as a senior captain, Royal Navy. But I would also have them as joint staffs, and... I would have them as areas of specialty, which link up with emb uh, with diplomatic, uh, the foreign office and diplomatic. So there would be a very much a hand in ha hand in glove working on British government needs of and British presence of. We've got the navy presence and we've got the diplomats, and we can go with each side. And if the diplomats aren't having are having trouble getting through or getting a meeting with people, oh, uh, would you like a warship visit to come on, uh, come and visit? And can it host a dinner? Ah oh, yes, and would you mind? Would you like to come to dinner? Yeah, well, you would, and then we can have a nice conversation. So, we'll have the two groups working together. Or, oh, we've got disaster relief. Okay, these ships are here. They can cover, carry these modules. They can carry cranes and their standflex modules, or extra boats, or something like that. They can come in and they can do this, that, and the other, and aid. Or we, the LSS, LSS can turn up and do aid and deliver that. And all the Marines can help out with this and that. And the thing would it be working so you'd have all these things would work as British presence, which would hopefully build up links, which means if there was a major war, if there was a problem coming up, we would be t known well in advance before we had to deal with something. Right. Royal Marines. My big beef, and I understand why the army has chosen the box trade PC. It is the best available. But... In my dream navy and dream scenario, the Royal Marines and the Strike Brigades all use the US Marine Corps ACV. And there is a reason for this. So in my the dream scenario, if I was in charge and doing it, this would mean that the Royal Marines would have amphibious armor which could self propel them ashore. But we'd have one amphibious slash strike brigade and two strike slash amphibious brigades. So if necessary, Britain could put together an amphibious division if it found itself fighting in, let's say, Southeast Asia or in Norway or any of those places in the world. It, and also those divisions, if something happens to the Channel Tunnel, could self-propel themselves to the other side of France 
uh, uh, to France, and then they'd need to pick up fuel along the way, but they could get their vehicles and their men across quite easily, without need for shipping or anything. If you needed to do a reverse Dunkirk, they could bring themselves back as well. Um, you know, it, these all these sort of options, and that would be my sort of scenario, because then that would also have given us free strike brigades, and they could work very well together. And if you consider the point class, the theory would be that the Marines would get there first with season area, but they'd have the same vehicles, and then the army could cut roll off the point class or etc. Get themselves into shore, and you have two brigades, and very much it, it, you could use your landing craft etc. for moving your heavy assets, but your troops, your personnel could get themselves straight to shore. So there wouldn't be a waiting off. There wouldn't be the risk of that Galahad scenario of them sitting on a ship waiting for landing craft to get them off there. They could roll themselves straight to shore. And you could get the Marines in the army and they could go in and they could do what they need to do. That's my critique of that. Now, seven astutes, that's what we're building. And then I've got five dreadnoughts. I've added in an extra one. So, Here's my theory on nuclear weapons. Britain has no space to store them on land. Having them flying around an aircraft is stupid and, and it runs the risk of them falling out of the air. And frankly, I don't want them space-based in satellites. So, you either have them or you don't have them. And if you have them, you keep them, uh, you keep them on a constant footing. If you have them in a scenario where you have to fuel them up on send them, put them out in the air or put them into out the sea, you are going to be raising tensions. The moment you're deploying them, that someone is going to have someone waiting for it to take it out because that is a threat. At constantly at sea, it is a deterrent. If you're deploying it in a crisis, that is a threat. Okay? That is why you have four. You can guarantee them at sea. Now, I can see the worry of people in this. And so I have a solution. You want to say you only have three ballistic missile submarines, but you want to be able to still guarantee they're at sea. Well, you build five. So administratively, you have three SSBNs. But two of those SSBNs are administratively, they have, well, reality, they have slotted into their ballistic missile tubes. They have cruise missiles. A cruise missile launches them. It's not beyond the wit of man. There is already available systems which are basically this. You can slot in to your ballistic missile tube a system which allows you to launch cruise missiles. Okay? You have then have an SSGM. For Britain, this makes up a, the scenario where we have the day one attack scenario because you can get your SSGN in nice and close to the enemy. Two, in any scenario where we are actually worrying about day one strike scenario, we are actually preparing for it's probably a preemptive strike or it's a war or it's a kind of Gulf War one scenario, in which case. You know it's coming, so even though you have one asset, you can organize that. It becomes an extra but a value added unit we can tell to allies we have. And it's something useful. And it allows you to say you only have three ballistic missile submarines. I mean the reality is you have five, but the reality is two of those are rolled as SGNs, and they're only rolled as SBNs in the event that one of those SB one of those SSBNs has an accident. And it needs to be fixed. I.e. it has a smash into something or something like that. Um, which two SBNs, both a British and a French one, managed to do, remember? Uh, they're so quiet, they didn't hear each other coming. So you have that guarantee. You can guarantee it at sea. But you are giving a stop to people, basically. Plus, SGNs are really useful. And six SSKs. Right, so I would love 13 SSNs. But the trouble is... We have one shipyard which produces nuclear submarines, and I think if I've got them building five dreadnoughts and they're finishing off the last of the seven astutes, then I'm probably overloading them as it is. I'm probably giving them a lot of work, especially if I want them to then build an astute successor class of seven to eight, maybe even nine subs. I can dream, right? This is a this is a sort of you know dream slash dream maybe. So I want six SSKs. Right, so the Japanese currently have a program called the 3000 Ton Submarine Project, which is the successor to the Soryuz. 
Now, the Soyuz should have been what the Australians should have got, frankly, um, but they didn't. They went for the French. And we'll leave that to one side. I'm sure they had good reasons. The French were offering, obviously offering very good technology. But the Soyuz are the gold standard, and they're off the shelf, and they're available. So you can buy them from Japan. We have good links with Japan. And you can anglicize them with a astute style sensor suite. Or you can join their 3,000 ton submarine project, where you could probably go right then. Um, how good are your sensors? We have this marvelous sensor suite, which is considered world beacon, and all these uh, things already. So we can offer you this. Can you build your stuff to operate with this? In which case, we'll combine together and we'll produce a joint submarine. I think if we did that, I think you'd probably very shortly shift to have the Canadians join you in procuring it. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Australian program continues to have issues if the Australians don't end up joining you. Um, it would be a very, very useful system. And it would be very good to have it because, let's put it this way, in that scenario, what you can do with SSKs is you can, if necessary, forward base them. So you could keep four for the UK, and two could go down to the Falklands as our forward base assets again. I'm forward basing quite a lot down there, but I have reasons for this. Okay. My reason for forward basing so much in the uh, South Atlantic is. I'm looking at how China is behaving at the moment and how other scenarios are. And I see the issue with China. They are building better submarines. They are building better equipment. I see the South Atlantic. I see that particular area, Antarctica and the South Atlantic, as an area which of potential friction in the future with China with those scenarios down there and I think honestly if we can stabilize it by going look we have a far closer base it's well secured we have this presence we have already built up the links with these nations we are already been here for years just don't try be our friend instead of being our enemy it's far more look at the advantages we can give you being our friend That's the way you sort of have to play it. But you can play that better from a position of strength than you can from weakness. And that depends as much on individual strength as it does collective strength. Because collective strength in the United States, in, 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 it's going to sound terrible. When you're talking about NATO, when you're talking about all these organizations, collective strength really does mainly refer to the American strength. Because it's American logistics, it's American forces which you depend upon. It's American presence, it's American bases. It's American troops. It's American money. Because, and I don't like to say it, Europe hasn't been freeloading. But in to an extent, a lot of European governments have considered the end of the Cold War and have used it and as a reason to spend a uh, cut spending, which is legitimate, but they've possibly gone a bit too far. They got a bit cut happy. I think they're very cut happy. And it's especially is true when it comes to global presence. Because this is a very much a global age. Okay, we can talk about COVID-19, we can talk about all these issues, but we are very much a global society, a global age. And therefore, you have to react to that. And you have to be present. If you want to have a say any things, you have to be present. So, my force proposed. And I've already gone through the top headline units and why. Um, Royal Marines, the brigade organised into four regular and two reserve self-contained battle groups, any three of which, of which can be combined into a, to form a full brigade. That's pretty much what I was thinking. So, And I was thinking that, honestly, the most you get is two Canberras and two bays operational in one point. So to get the rest of the brigade, you probably need the point class. And people would have to be having some very, very bad accommodation. But, you know, they survive. Modify in, in future, I'd like to sort of be in heart. If I'm going to be using the point class as my strategic lift assets and their success as a strategic lift, A, I'd like six of them. And B, I'd like them to have better accommodation on them. So they can take that extra third of a, brig uh, third of a brigade. I just realized I can do that. Hmm. Fun. All right, aircraft. I've got land base 16 regular and 88 reserve P8s for a total force of 24. 
provide flights based at Diego Garcia and the Falklands, cover UK, and provide a surge capacity for times of high stress. How can you have reserve aircraft? Well, the nicest way, the air crews, the P-8s are very, very similar to their regular Boeing civilian airliner cousins, or siblings, almost. And um, so you can have a reservist could be something, and it could be something which would be very useful to have a surge capacity. And I know eight are currently looking at record, so I've basically trebled the number of aircraft being procured, but I've only doubled the number of regular service personnel. I would also suggest that maybe they should become joint assets um, on the long lines of the F-35B, with the Royal Navy providing a significant number of crew and personnel, as well as the Air Force. The reason being they do operate in the maritime sphere, and I think this would be a better way of making them truly a joint force asset by making them truly joint force. I think it also spreads the burden of manning them and making the case for them in government. A joint force asset has two services to make the case for it, and P8s are essential. They are useful things. I have kept the five um, rivers, but I also have 12 inshore archer class sort of star vessels. Apparently we don't have 12, but I would like 12 uh, because I think they're very good. They're currently used by University Royal Navy Reserve, University Reserve units, and I think they're good. Um, 16 MCMVs, I haven't covered this enough. I should have gone into this more, but you need to keep the four in base in the Gulf. Um, and with 12 more, I would be looking at basing a couple in Singapore, a forward base in Singapore. I would probably uh, keep the rest back in the UK, but positioned out to cover Recife, Portsmouth, Plymouth, Southampton, Medway, all the places which could, oh, there are mines, ouch. And um, keep the four oceanographic survey squadron about the same. You know, we've got the great big HMS Scott, we've got um, HMS Echo and HMS Enterprise, and we've got the little teeny one, which I've forgotten the name of now, and the Arctic Patrol ship. You need them. And I've got a global regiment presence because um, if uh, for the Royal Marines, so basically, if you've got the LSS. It's each, they're going to be carrying about a company unit, is what I'm considering. Company under the command of a major, I would expect. If you're going to be forward deploying them, expect them to do a sort of solo missions. Um, and I've got about eight of those, so they can have a rollover, uh, and a sort of, you know, in case they can change over while they're further away and they can get time back home. Seems more sensible to me to do that way. And then you have, so eight companies is what I've got for that. Which is why I called it a regiment rather than a commando, because a commando is drink to brigade, and I would have each of those battle groups. I would call a commando. I would have each commando organized to become one of those brigade, basically the basis of those battle groups. So you'd end up with four regular and two reserve commandos. Um, I know we've currently dropped down, but again, it's my dream Royal, Royal Navy Royal Marines, and it's what I'm justifying. So that's what I'm going for. Anyway. So, this is the more normal content, naval history stuff. A uh, lot coming up on the Back Pocket Cruisers. That's very cool. And uh, of course, that's my book. And the Patreon video, which of course is voted for by the patrons. So, that's the first one of the Patreon voted videos, is coming up on the 6th of July. And then we have Pre Tribals and Patreon video. And then as well, Mara King, Mara Nostrum, a hollow jest. Are in some reason, the train is going to be fun. Got some books on order for that one. Uh, where else you can find me? <clears throat> Twitter, mainly. But I have been trying Parlour, as I said recently. And Patron, if you want to fund the book, uh, the book addiction. It's always very kind. And thank you very much. I hope you found this enjoyable and interesting. I thank you very much to my subscribers. Thank you very much to everyone who's made me four, uh, given me 4,000 subscribers. I'm hoping that I keep, I'm going to keep this going, and I'm hoping going to get many, many more. Um, mainly because it allows me to gloat to my aunt, and I do love that. No. Familial bragging rights are critical, but also uh, the, it's been a real big um, confidence boost. Before COVID-19, uh, I had got, I came and hit, I had actually had um, 
eight job rejections in the last three weeks before COVID-19. Uh, four pre-interview, two post-interview, two didn't even be bother to contact me until about literally just went, oh, yeah, you're not doing it. We, we decided not to proceed with your application. We decided, and it's just sort of, you know, it, it becomes a bit other, uh, annoying, especially as four of those universities have employed me as a contract lecturer, and in fact, all four would like to employ me again as a contract lecturer, apparently, judging by my recent emails. So, but they don't want to employ me as a permanent member of staff, which confuses the life of me. Anyway, leaving that to one side, uh, thank you very much, and um, take care. Have a nice day and hope you enjoyed the thank you.